Let's see what I got in the mail. Let's see what it is. Oh, no. It's a late fee. Go errors are often a lot like this. You have to unwrap them to see what's inside. And in this video, I'm going to show you several techniques you can use to unwrap and inspect your Go errors so you know exactly what you're dealing with. Hi, I'm Jonathan Hall. I've already done a number of videos about error handling in Go, in particular how to wrap errors. This is kind of the reverse. I'm going to talk about how to unwrap errors and how to inspect them. There are many techniques. Some are better and stronger than others, but each one has its own place. And I'm going to walk you through some of them to help you do a better job of error handling in your Go code. Let's get started. Let's start with this very simple program that essentially implements a cat capability. It asks you to enter a file name, and then it reads the file contents and dumps the output. If it fails to read the file name at the moment, it just panics. Let me demonstrate. So here we just get a panic that says uh, foo.txt, no such file or directory. Not very nice. Uh, we could probably do better than that. Uh, what I would like to do is modify this program to specifically detect a not found error and do something more useful with that. If we look here at the Go doc for the OS package and the standard library, we'll see that there's this value called error not exist. It should be returned by any number of functions when the file requested does not exist. So let's see if we can just check for that error and uh, do something useful with that. So let's execute this and see what happens. It still panics. Now, why would that be? You would probably expect it returns that error type in this case, right? So it does, sort of. Let me explain. Checking for direct error equality doesn't work the way you probably expect it to. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. But first, let me show you the alternative that does work in this case. Here back in the Go doc, we can see that there's this exposed function called is not exist that accepts an error and it returns a Boolean. Let's try using that instead. There, now we get the output that we were expecting. So here we see that using direct equality or inequality, such as the equal equal operator or the exclamation equal operator, is bad practice, usually, when checking error types. Some libraries will expose their own error checking functions. The OS library is an example with the is not exist error checker. There are other such functions in the same uh, package. You can see is exist uh, and so on. And other packages in the standard library or third party libraries may also have such functions that you can use to check for specific types of errors. However, since Go 1.13 was released a long time ago, we now have better ways to do this in most cases. And I'll be talking about some of those approaches for most of the rest of the video. But before we get into that, let's talk about one other way to check for errors, and that is string comparison. If I revert back to my early version of the program, then I can show you string comparison for the sake of demonstration. So now I can see that I have the error open foo.txt, no such file or directory. So I'm going to check for that exact error string uh, as my comparison. So you can see now that that check works well enough for that specific input, but I'm sure you've noticed that this probably won't work for any other input. Let me demonstrate. Now the er error output has changed because my input file name has changed, so it doesn't match the string anymore. Now there are obvious solutions to this. I could use a regular expression or maybe a string contains comparison. Let me show you how that works. Now I have a more robust error check. If the error contains the string, no such file or directory in any form, then uh, it will have the proper error output. Now there's actually a potential for a false positive here. And let, let me explain. If I had a file that actually was called no such file or directory, or maybe it had that as a string in its path, maybe it's uh, 500 characters long, but part of the file name is no such file or directory. 
and it fails to open it for some other reason, maybe a permission denied error, for example, then this would trigger that. And it would claim that this is a file not found error, even though it's actually a permission denied error, for example. Further, the error strings might change over time. And in fact, some particular error strings do change and have changed in the standard library. Uh, and in third party libraries, all bets are off. So it's very unsafe to assume that the error string is a reliable indicator of the error type or the error condition. So this should only be used in a last resort when nothing else can be done. And we'll talk about the alternatives for that next. So back in Gil 1.13, as I mentioned, we added the capability to do error wrapping and unwrapping. And I actually have another video that goes into some of the details on that. Uh, but in this video, I'll talk about more of the practical application. Check out the link up here or in the description if you want to watch that video too. So the first thing I'm going to demonstrate is how to use the errors.is function because that's a really simple one to use uh, for this sort of check. So the way you use errors.is is you pass in two arguments. The first is the error you're checking to see if it matches something. And the second argument is the error you want it to match. So in this case, I'm checking whether or not uh, the error I received from read file matches os.error not exist. Let's see what it does. So here we see that the condition triggers. And this is another example of why using direct equality can be problematic. Direct equality checks that an error value matches something exactly. And in this case, it did not, as you'll recall. However, it does match the errors.is condition. That can happen for at least two different reasons. One is that our raw error type, os.error not exists, is wrapped by other errors that might be done in the standard library or by third party libraries. And the second is that there might be a custom implementation of the errors.is interface on that type that can do some smarter checking than a direct equality can. So let's investigate a little bit further what exactly this os.read file is returning as an error and uh, try to understand why the errors.is works, but the direct equality does not. So I'm going to start by using fmt.printf to print the type of the error that we're getting returned. And the percent capital T verb will give the type of the argument passed. So let's try this. So I'm getting an FS path error. This makes sense. So here I am in the GoDoc for the FS package. Let's look for path error. Yeah, here we go. So a path error is this struct that contains three fields, OP, path, and an underlying error. So what's happening here is that the underlying error is of the value error not exist. So that's why direct equality doesn't work because direct equality is checking against the wrapping t uh, value. Uh, but the errors dot is does work because it unwraps that uh, error type by calling the unwrap uh, method on it until it finds uh, a child uh, error that matches. So let's look again at errors.unwrap to have a clearer sense of what's going on there. So what the unwrap function does in the errors package is it takes any error that has a wrapped error within it and returns the next level down. Uh, if there is no wrapped error in it, it just returns a nil. And the way that's described in the GoDoc is it says unwrap returns the result of calling the unwrap method on ERR. So in other words, if the ERR implementation implements the unwrap method, then it calls it and returns its value. If it doesn't, it returns nil. So that's exactly what we have going on here in the case of path error. The path error value returned by os.readfile does implement the unwrap method. And that unwrap method, if we look at the source code here, returns e.err, which is going to correspond to the uh, os or fs.error.notExists error. So that's the mechanics behind why calling errors.is works, but doing direct equality does not. And it also explains why you should use errors.is instead of er equality. Let's now consider the little bit more advanced case of errors.as. Errors.as and errors.is are similar in that they both do automatic behind the scenes unwrapping of errors. 
The difference is that errors.is only returns true or false depending on whether or not the error or its chain of children matches your expectation. Whereas errors.as gives you access to that wrapped error type. Let me demonstrate how that works. Here I've updated the code to call errors.as. Now, the way you have to do this is you have to first create a variable to hold your target error, and it needs to be of the target type. So here I've created a variable called PE for path error, and it's of type pointer to fs.pathError. Then I call errors.as with my, my actual error, the one returned from os.read file, and then I pass in a pointer to my target value. So in this case, it's a pointer to a pointer to fs.path error. Errors.as will return true if ERR or one of its children is of this type. And if it does return true, it assigns that value to my variable PE. So on the next line, then I will print out all the details from that error, the three fields that we saw in the GoDoc. Let's see what happens. So now we can see all three components of that path error. The OP is open, that's the operation that failed. Path is foo.txt, that's the path that it was trying to open. And then ERR, no such file or directory, is the error that occurred. Now let's talk about combining some of these different approaches. Uh, this is, can be especially helpful if you're using libraries that don't expose proper error types. Maybe they only expose strings and there's no way, you don't have this sort of path error type of struct that gives you the details you need. So maybe you're stuck doing string comparison. I still advise you to use either errors.as or errors.is as appropriate uh, to the greatest extent possible, but then maybe you have to use string comparison at some point. Let me demonstrate what I mean by at some point. Let's imagine that path errors error value was just a string and not an actual error type. And so then I wanted to do string comparison at that level. I could do that right here. Now I'm back to the behavior I expect. Let me show you what I've done in the code. So here I have used errors.as, as before, exactly the same as before, to uh, have an error of type fs.pathError. This could be very valuable if my os.read file, for example, was called by some other function that wrapped the error in who knows how many other layers. This would help me sort of peel back the onion until I get to that fs path error. Once I've done that, I know that I have a path error, obviously, and then I can do my own inspection. So here I'm imagining I can't simply do errors.is or equality check. So I'm doing a string comparison, but I'm doing a very well-contained string comparison of only a specific part of the larger error struct. So this is a lot safer than comparing against the entire string itself. You'll notice that this would not fail in the case that I mentioned earlier, where I have a file called no such file or directory with a permission denied error. That would not trigger this case because in that case, the no such file or directory string would show up as part of the path, not as part of the error string. So this saves me from that particular pitfall. It's still less robust than doing proper error equality checking with errors.as and errors.is, but sometimes this is necessary. So if you have an API that's returning error strings that you simply cannot control and cannot inspect further, you may have to do some of this, but use that as a last resort and ideally combine it with errors.as or errors.is or some other type of uh, check to give you the best, most robust error checking possible. So we've made it through a number of ways to check for errors in Go. You can use direct equality, although 
you should virtually never do that except in very specific cases when the API asks you to or calls for it. You can use uh, library checks. Those are mostly obsoleted by Go 1.13, but they do still exist and sometimes can be useful. You can do string comparisons, which should be used only as a last resort when the other options aren't available. And then finally, you can use errors.as and errors.is, which are the preferred ways of checking for errors because they do the unwrapping for you and they make your life a whole lot simpler. So with that out of the way, I need to go pay a late fee. Until next time, boldly go.